What I'm talking about is training now for ministry in the future. I mean, that's what all of Moore College is about. But as you get detailed study of uh, Greek and of church history and of the uh, complexities of uh, the discussions that you can have on the subjects of the Trinity and uh, on the different alternatives of atonement theologies and the rest, you can get lost. The forest can get lost for the trees. The trees get like, you, you lose what the whole thing is about. And so you need to keep being reminded. That's what chapel does for you amongst other things. But what are we doing and why are we doing it? Why am I in college? Where am I going to go in the long term as a result of this? There's an immediate result. That is your, your job as a student minister. How do you use this training that I'm getting week by week to be a better minister of the church I'm in? This training is for the immediate future. It's the immediate future in terms of the missions that you're about to go on, which are very important. But they're important for the people, the churches you're going to, but they're really important for you because it reminds you why you are bothering learning your Greek paradigms. It's got to do with why you are here, what it's, what it's about. You need to have mission as one of the characteristics, one of the traditions of this college is to keep people in student ministry and keep people going on missions each year. Really important because it's so easy to get so locked into the library, which you should be locked into, so locked into the airspace, which you should be locked into, that you forget what the whole thing is about and you over four years start to think the whole thing is about learning. It, it's not about learning, it's about ministering the gospel and the learning is for that purpose. And so the long term future, wherever God is taking you is important. Let me ask you a question, an arithmetic question here for a moment or two. Uh, 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 just a quick, and those who love maths and arithmetic, you call out for us by all means. Just thinking arithmetically, what does 24 mean for you? Hours of, the day. Hours of the day. That's not mathematical, that's social, but quite true, yes? <laughs> two times 12. Mm -hmm. Six times four. Six times four, two times 12. Three by eight. Three by eight, good. One less than 25, yes. Five times five minus one, yes. Half of 48, yes. Yeah. Square root of 576, yeah. <laughs> Good, okay. We'll come back to it. First point I want to make is evangelism is not an optional extra. Evangelism is not an optional extra. So there are three Bible passages on the left-hand side of your sheet, which you should recognize. The top one comes from where, please? 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 11 where he's talking about there are speaking gifts and there are all the other gifts and those who speak should speak the oracles of God. If you're going to be trained here in college to be a speaker in the church of the people of God, if you're going to be one who is going to be the mouth speak, the mouth person, then what you have to speak is the very oracles of God, which is why you've got to study very properly. You've got to really study hard. You've got to actually make sure that what you are saying is what God is saying if you're going to be God's spokesman. That's really important, you see. But if you're going to speak, you're going to speak the very oracles of God. 1 Peter 4, 11, which is important. The second one is from? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 and verse 5. People have these as separated, but they are actually the same thing. That is, those who preach the word are doing the work of an evangelist. It's not that he's saying, you've got to do all these things, Timothy. Oh, and also, seeing the evangelists are a lazy bodge, you do the work of an evangelist as well. No, no, it's by preaching the word in season, out of season, when it's of convenience to you, when it's not convenient to you, you will be fulfilling your ministry, doing the work of an evangelist, and this is what Timothy must be engaged in. It's not two different things, it's the same thing. And the third quote comes from? In everything I do... Sorry? 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Yes, the last verse of chapter 10, the first verse of chapter 11. Paul says, in everything I do, whatever it might be, I do all for the glory of God. But then he says, whatever I do, I do that others may be saved. I put myself out for the salvation of others. 
And then comes the great, the great punch in it. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. This is not an optional extra for Christians. This is what Christian life is about. This is a true saying, worthy of all men to be received. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I'm going to be like Christ and I don't care about sinners and I'm not going to go into the world and save anybody is completely illogical and inconsistent. If I'm going to be like Christ, I must go into the world to save sinners. What what would Jesus do is a question we never need to ask because we know what Jesus did. So you don't have to think up what would Jesus do in this situation. We know exactly what Jesus did. He came into the world to save sinners. That's what he did. And that's what you must do and I must do because that's what the apostle did. And the apostle says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so in everything we do, whatever it is that we are doing, seeking the glory of God and the salvation of other people is what life is about. It's how we live. So evangelism, you see, is not an optional extra for super spiritual Christians. It is just part of Christian living. And it therefore lies at the heart of the ministry of the word. Because if you're going to speak the very oracles of God, what are you going to preach? What are you going to speak other than the gospel? For that is the very oracles of God. The word we minister is the gospel of Jesus. You mustn't make evangelism as some subset of Christian ministry and of Christian life. Evangelism is Christian ministry is Christian life. That's where we need to have it, right at the centre. So when we look at the pastor's task, which you see at the top right-hand side of that thing now, when you look at the pastor's task, by pastor, of course, I don't mean counsellor, nor necessarily a pastor of a church, a pastor of a Bible study group, a pastor of a youth fellowship or a Sunday school. Uh, A pastor is a a shepherd and they shepherd shepherds a flock. Pastoral work is not personal work. Personal work is personal work. Personal work is really good. One-to-one is marvellous ministry. It's just not pastoral. A shepherd that only has one sheep has a very short future in, in, in the industry. Right? <laughs> Shepherds have a flock and you shepherd a flock. You don't shepherd a sheep. Uh, you shepherd sheep but not a sheep. And so if you're going to lead a group of people be it a whole congregation, be it just a Bible study group, be it if you're going to be shepherding, then it's not by being a counsellor in a single relationship, but it's the leadership of a group. And remember, the sheep always grow like their shepherd. And so if this is the case, you've got to be very clear about what the business people would call your core business. That is, you're leading the flock by teaching the word of God, that is, preaching and teaching the gospel. Now, we use the scriptures to do it because that's the best way in which to preach the gospel most faithfully, most clearly, because the scriptures make you wise unto salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Old Testament scriptures do that, let alone the New Testament. And so we proclaim Christ's sufferings and the subsequent glories and call upon the world to repent and find forgiveness of their sins. You can find it at the end of Luke 20, Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 44 following, where Jesus is in the upper room with the disciples and he tells them about what the scriptures are about, namely the sufferings of the Christ and his resurrection, and also that you could preach repentance and forgiveness of sins to the ends of the earth. That's what the whole Bible is about, really. And so you can see it in the the Apostle Paul when he speaks to the Ephesian elders in uh, Acts 20, how he goes from house to house preaching repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus. There's his summary of his life's work and his ministry in that verse, Acts 20, 20. Indeed, you'll see on the front, I've given a quote from Don Carson, who says, the great perennial need in this sin-enslaved world is to train Christians to think clearly about what the gospel is and how to articulate it. That, that's what we desperately need in each and every generation. More of that in a moment then. And so the way you pastor is by teaching. Indeed, the word pastor and teacher is linked in Ephesians 4. You know, apostles, uh, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. 
and there's one, only one article for the two thing because the way you pastor is by teaching and the way you teach is pastorally. It's the way you lead the flock. That is, we don't lead the flock by government, by power, by position, by authority. We certainly don't do it for personal gain, but we do it by the truth of God's word. As we teach God's word to people, their hearts and minds are changed so that they will make decisions that are right and true and proper. Our task as pastors is to so teach the group that the group will decide rightly what the group should be doing. That's what we need to be such teachers. And so in our teaching, we must take the lead by setting the example. It's not just what I say, it's what I do. In fact, it's the opposite of what is commonly said. You know, don't do what I do, just do what I say. The Bible is consistent. It says, do what I do and do what I say, because I will say what I should be doing and I will do what I should be doing. So Paul, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. He, he, he actually chose to model himself properly. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he said, I worked with my hands so that you would have a model of what you should be doing, 2 Thessalonians 3. And in, uh, 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 in 1 Thessalonians 2, he points to himself as a model. I, I was with you as a, care, as a nursing mother. I was with you as a loving father. And the whole chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, you'll find Paul holds himself as the model. He was purposeful in his setting, his example. And so when we are setting the example, we face inside our church a diversity of ministries. How do we help as the pastor of the group? How do we help to use to div the diversity of ministries and gifts that people have? I mean, some will be treasurers, some will be administrators, some will be musicians, some will be for ho in hospitality. So all kinds of people do all kinds of things in the Christian fellowship. Your task is to lead the team so that the team works together to achieve the corporate goals. That's where the pastor, the leader of the group, is involved. How do you do it? By teaching, yes, but to do it in such a way that there's no silos of competing ministries. The Sunday school teachers never talk to the youth fellowship leaders who never talk to the women. You've been to those churches where in the, in the kitchen there are different cupboards that are locked because the, the crockery is owned by different groups and they won't let the other groups use the crockery. It, it screams that the gospel is not running this church. Right? That the, the people in, the, in, in administrative power are running the church. Uh, there must be overlapping, complementary ministries. And so we do it by calling all members to the common way of life, namely love. You see that in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. But also to the common vision of life and church, which is the gospel. When people, when one group ministry loses the sight of the gospel, is when they start pulling away into different activities. You've got to unite the congregation on the thing that unites us, the gospel of the Lord Jesus. <coughs> Any other uniting will lead to disunity and disharmony down the track. We're not united because we're Presbyterian. We're not united because we're Anglican. That's a disaster. Uh, it just doesn't work because that just means you become more and more Presbyterian and less and less Christian more and more Anglican, less and less Christian. What unites a congregation has got to be the gospel of the Lord Jesus and nothing else. That's what must unite us. That's the leader's responsibility to teach the gospel, to so clearly articulate the gospel that the congregation are united with a common understanding of the gospel. Have this mind amongst you, which you have in Christ Jesus, who though is in the form of God, did not account equal. But notice the appeal have this mind amongst you. You've got to have the same way of thinking as Jesus thinks. That's the role of the pastor, is to give people that same mindset so that they will work together harmoniously because they have the common view on life, the common vision. And so the vision is the gospel of our Lord, which must rule the church life. And it also needs, of course, to rule the individual members' lives. And so what does the gospel ministry and evangelism 
That next heading seems a little bit strange. How can you have anything but a gospel ministry in evangelism? Uh, I'm saying that. How do you minister the gospel in evangelism as a pastor of a flock? Well, you must teach evangelism and you must model evangelism so that they will have the common mind of the world mission of the gospel. If the pastor is not evangelising, the congregational members will not evangelise. And so the gospel and its ministry will not unite the church. The idea that, well, I'm not an evangelist, I'm just going to be a pastor, is a complete nonsense. Because what you'll be is a non-evangelistic pastor. And a non-evangelistic pastor does not pastor the sheep properly. You cannot do that. You can't use pastoral Bible teaching as an alternative to being an evangelist. It just doesn't work, my friends. And it comes out in everything. Now that I'm not preaching four times every Sunday, I'm going and hearing other people preach every now and then in different places. And I can tell the preachers who are evangelising and the preachers who are not evangelising from their sermons. Just the way they read the Bible, the way they understand the Bible, the way they preach the Bible. They don't, I don't have to go and ask them, you know, have you been evangelising lately? I know they haven't <laughs> just by the way they read the Bible. And I know they have because of the way they read the Bible. It's as clear as a bell if you know what you're looking for. It's very apparent. And there are some that you think, I don't think he's ever shared the gospel with anybody because the way he reads the Bible is not through the gospel. <laughs> It's through the technicalities of exegesis. It's all very correct. It's just wrong. Because <laughs> it can't see the forest for the trees. We investigate each tree individually, but we have no idea what the whole thing is about. Because the heart of the matter, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, is not the heart of the preacher. Which is very sad. And the more erudite and the more fluent and the more impressive he is, the sadder it is. <laughs> because the church will be very erudite and very impressive. But the Lord Jesus won't be preached. And there is a real problem. And people will not be reaching out to their neighbours with the gospel. So, well, how do they then, how to... How to teach evangelism. That is, it's not sufficient to know your Bible well. It's really important that you do. <laughs> don't get me wrong. You must, don't waste your time here at Moore College. You must come out here with the best knowledge of the Bible you can. But that's not enough. You also have to learn how to teach the Bible. That's another skill set. You, you can have all the knowledge in your head and not be able to teach it. Um, I heard one famous evangelical theologian here uh, came from overseas, visited us, gave us a couple of talks. Great one. I'd read his books. Fantastic. Unutterably boring. Really one of the most boring speakers I'd ever heard. <laughs> Great shame, because it was all up there, but he couldn't get it out through here to anybody else. I was in England at one time, a very famous speaker was speaking there. I was sitting next to him, pearls of wisdom were flowing from his lips. My wife was with me, we were writing notes, we were furiously writing notes. We looked around, there were 35 uh, curates, basically assistant ministers there in the room, recent graduates of colleges. We looked around the room, Helen nudged me and pointed it out to me, everyone in the room, other than Helen and I who were taking notes and the speaker, were asleep. Literally, physically, he'd, he'd lulled them all off to sleep. <laughs> Delivering what were articles that, he, the way he spoke, it was just like an article from the New Bible Dictionary. You know, it was just, the content was brilliant. The delivery was soporific. <laughs> it just, you've got to learn how to teach as well as what it is that you've got to teach. Now, 
when it comes to evangelism, there's many and diverse ways in which you can evangelize. I don't want to put evangelism into a straitjacket as I'm going to talk about two ways to live in a few moments time. There are all kinds of courses and programs from evangelism explosion to uh, the bridge to life to how do you know God personally. There's all kinds of programs for teaching people how. But which ones are you going to do? Or I would encourage you, which one are you going to do? Because it's best to unite the congregation. It must be theologically faithful to the gospel and to evangelism. That's the hallmark of it. There's no point training people and teaching people evangelism and evangelistic method or evangelistic content that is not right. That's a disaster. It must be effective in uh, enabling average members, the average member, not you, not me, the average member of the congregation to know the gospel, to share the gospel when opportunity arises and to unite the congregation with a common understanding of the gospel. If I've got a, a, an evangelistic package which is so complicated that only more college graduates can use it, that's not going to do the job. That's not going to help. I've got to make it as something that the average member of the congregation can use, which will be beneath your dignity, you proud and arrogant person. <laughs> and so I want to commend to you two ways to live. I, I get embarrassed about commending it. So I've written Don Carson's commendation on the back. <laughs> <laughs> Just to help you see that here is the great Uncle Don who can tell us. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a thoughtful part of his book, Gagging of God. At the risk of oversimplification, most evangelistic tools in the Western world are subject of subsets of systematic theology. By this I mean that they tend to ask atemporal questions and give atemporal answers. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with this pattern as long as the people to whom it is presented have already been brought up in a Judeo-Christian heritage, which of course in America is much more common than in Australia. But if you present these atemporal outlines of the gospel to those who know nothing about the Bible's plotline and who have bought into one form or another of the New Age theosophy, how will they hear you? In short, the good news of Jesus Christ is virtually incoherent unless it is securely set into a biblical worldview. In the last few years, several evangelistic tools have been created that are far more sensitive to the Bible's storyline. The first of these to be prepared is still the one of the most effective two ways to live presents Christ in six steps. The six steps offering in contemporary English something of the Bible's plot line as the necessary framework in which to understand the gospel. Thank you, Don. Couldn't have written it better myself. And there's only a couple of big words in it, which is unusual for Don. Now, <laughs> let me commend you. See, what is two ways to live? First thing to understand is it's a catechism. That is what it is. It is a catechism. It is a way of teaching. It's not an evangelistic tract to be given out. It's published as a tract. I'm sorry that it is in some ways because that misleads people. It's a very useful thing to have as a tract. I've got it as an app on my phone as well. But it actually is a catechism to be learnt off by heart by Christians. That's, that's what it's written to be. That's what its aim is. It's not a strategy for evangelism. Every now and then when we go out and talk to strangers on the street, people get converted. Marvellous, wonderful. But if you think we're going to reach the world by going out and talking to people on the street, think again. As a strategy, it's not the best strategy. That's not the purpose for doing it, really. It's a gospel catechism for Christians. Now, the catechisms you know, if you know any, are written at the Reformation. So the Anglican one is all about the sacraments because that was the big fight in Anglicanism. The Presbyterian one is all about everything in life because that's Presbyterianism. This is a catechism for 21st century Gentiles. It's not for Australians. It's used all over the world. It comes from here. But it's 21st century Gentiles. It's not for Jews because you wouldn't bother teaching Jews about creation. They know that's the bit they all agree on. And so in the gospel presentations in the book of Acts, etc., he never discusses creation except when he talks to Gentiles. But we're mainly talking to Gentiles in Australia and the world today. And so it's 21st century Gentile. It follows the logic of the Bible, which is what Don, Don's point is about. 
Now, that's what this sheet is, in case you didn't know. This is, this is more of what Two Ways to Live is than, than a tract is. But it really is not even about that. What it's about is being able to draw it in six pages. You just pick out a page, you get a napkin at the, at the restaurant and you say to the person, let me explain to you what Christianity is about in just six ideas. Because there are six great ideas. And so the first one is, see, God is the ruler of the world. That's why I represented him as a crown. Because God is the ruler of the world. He's made the world and he's made everything in the world and he's made man as the ruler of the world under his authority. And so I have six pictures, you see, that are the catechism of the gospel. So as you look down there, you might like to be writing in there, giving you space to doodle the pictures yourself. They're all dead simple pictures about the fact of humans desire to run the world themselves without God and so they make themselves reject God and so then you have the one about judgment which comes which talks about uh, it's appointed unto all men to die once and after that the judgment and then it talks about the atonement with uh, Jesus coming into the world uh, oops, 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 that's, that's, that's the next picture uh, <laughs> where Jesus has risen from the dead and then it gives you the two choices of life, you see. Either you run the world your own way, your own life your own way, or you accept Jesus as the ruler of your life and it presents the... That's what Two Ways to Live is about, drawing six diagrams in order to explain the gospel in six steps that follows the Bible's pattern. Very simple. It, but it's to be learnt off by heart. That's the whole script. It's not a very long script to learn off by heart, but that's the aim of it. Now, why, why do you do this? Why do you... I can walk into a room and ask a group of educated people, 24, and you can immediately think of all connections, 12 and 2, 8 and 3, 6 and 4, half of 48, 1 less than 25. How can you do that? Because you all went to primary school. And in primary school, they drilled you in, in the times tables until each number has a kind of location in your head. There's a map where you can drop a number in. If I said to you it's 36, you're already thinking, aren't you? Right? Some of you aren't. I know, it's really difficult. <laughs> but you're already thinking six sixes and you're already thinking three twelves and you're already, right? Each number has a set of relationships built into it because you were taught it properly in the first place. Two Ways to Live is a catechism like the Times Table. It teaches you the basic gospel presentation outline so that wherever you are, when any subject comes up, you can say, oh yeah, that's connected to this and that's connected to that. People start talking about sin, about any problem in the world today, immorality of the world. You think, oh, hey, I'm on page two. Now, they won't understand page two unless I take them back to page one and then move them onto page three. But I know where I'm going because, you know, if they talk about judgment, you know, it's about time those people are punished. Yes, God is the great punisher. He believes in judgment. I can go there immediately, you see, because I know. But you won't understand why you're going to be under judgment unless you get to, we all reject God. But I know where to take the conversation because I know how it all fits together in my head because I've been catechised in it. Just like I was catechised. And most Christians today aren't catechised. And so they've got vague ideas about the gospel. And when the conversation comes up, they give their vague ideas. And they don't know how to move the gospel to repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus. They don't know how to close the deal, as the, as the, as the salespeople would talk about. If you don't know how to close the deal, you'll never take people through the process, through the logic of it. What this is as a training program is a catechism for people. It's theologically sound. Last year I did six lectures at this time of the year about the theology that lies behind that. But what would you want in a gospel presentation? You've got it here. Creation, sin, judgment, atonement, resurrection, response. What other subjects are there that you would want in the gospel? They're all there. And under each one of them, 
there's just a few points to remember. Under creation, what do you need to remember? Well, you need to know that God is the creator. He's the ruler of the world, that he's made the world and he's made humans in a particular place in the image of God in a particular place. And that's what you need to know about it. What do you need to know about sin? Well, you need to know that we've all sinned. We need to know that sin is rejection of God. We need to know that it's we try to run our life our own way. And we need to know that we actually lose control of the world because of it. What do I need to know about? See, each of these little sentences here is the summary of what you need to know under those doctrines. There's loads more you could know, but this is what you need to know in order to be able to present the gospel. It's secondly, memorably delivered. It's kinesthetic. As you speak it, you draw it. Now, those of you who are typing notes, mistake. <laughs> you don't learn as much typing as you do writing notes. It's not that I'm a Luddite, I'm actually speaking from the power, I, I actually use computers, or essence, but actually taking notes, don't do it on a typewriter because you don't learn as much. Your finger memory doesn't work in the same way as your hand memory in writing. Learning kinesthetically is an important part. Learning visually is an important part as, as a way. So you learn by words, by visuals, by doing at the same time. It's the easiest way of having a catechism that you'll be able to to take on board. Thirdly, it's got to be useful for ministry. And this is because it's a way of presenting the gospel to people. The gospel is full of complex ideas, many, many complex ideas. The idea of creation, the idea of God, the idea of sin, the idea of judgment. They're complex ideas before you've reached the atonement. Yet without these three ideas, Jesus dying on the cross is one of the most meaningless things that has ever been said. So you talk about Jesus dying on the cross with someone, to get them to understand it, there's lots of background complex ideas that you need to be able to convey to people. This is a way of organising those complex ideas in a way that best people can understand. So it's all written in non-religious jargon. We don't talk about sin, we talk about rejection and rebellion. We don't talk about faith, we talk about submitting our lives to Jesus or trusting Jesus. We don't talk, it's a whole get rid of the jargon and speak in normal English, Aussie English to people about it. And so it, it also means you can control the conversations. If you use a piece of paper like this, you've drawn up six things, you say, well, look, let me finish before we ask the, answer your questions, you know? And, well. Yeah, that question's really good. It's because you haven't understood this one. Let me go over this again. Actually doing it physically, visually, you can control a conversation much better than just talking to people where you get taken offline and, and you never get back to where you wanted to get back to. It's, it comes to the point of response. Itself, it's not a method of evangelism. It's the method of training, catechizing Christians to evangelise and uniting the congregation on the gospel. Because when I've got the whole congregation knowing the gospel in these words, well, we all know what the centre point is, don't we? From here on, we can teach beyond that. It's an understanding of the gospel, which of course is critical in living it, and uniting the congregation, but it's also critical in sharing it with others. If you don't understand it with absolute clarity, you'll never teach it to anybody. And this just clarity, that's what this is about. It's getting the absolute thin edge of the wedge before you put it in. And so learning the gospel, it's not automatic when you convert it. Uh, pastors have to teach it to people. It's relating it to conversation. See, the best spontaneity is planned, prepared, and practiced. <laughs> That's the best spontaneity. If we don't know where we're going in a conversation, we're bound to go nowhere. If we don't know where we're going in a conversation, we, if we do know where we're going, we can turn the conversation to the direction we want to go. But that means you've got to know a clear gospel outline because from that, you can be flexible. But without it, you can't go anywhere. Now, as I say, do another one if you like. You know, do the bridge to life. It's Arminian, and if you're an Arminian, you'll feel happier with it. But if you want to follow a Calvinist one along the lines of biblical theology, 
two ways to live is where you need. That's your home country, right? Just uh, mention this little point to you. It's also important that you experienced in the difficulty. See, med students, doctors are taught by, they're trained by, you watch one, you do one, then you teach one. That's how they learn to operate. You watch someone operate, then you do the operation, and then you teach it. Just watching it never teaches you how to do it. <laughs> You've got to do it to actually learn how to do it. And if you don't start teaching it, you'll forget how to do it very soon. Teaching enables you to remember to keep doing it. That's the same principle here with evangelism. Doing evangelism is necessary to learning evangelism. If you said to me, Philip, will you come out in the street today and preach the gospel out in the street? My answer is, I'm very busy. I'm sorry, I haven't got time for that. I don't want to. I'm scared. I'm apprehensive about it. I'm, I'm nervous. I, I feel inadequate. I don't want to go and do it. Now, there are some people in this room who say, that's strange, Philip. I love doing it. And I say, they're strange. <laughs> that's a psychiatric disorder. It is a, you want to break across the norms, the social norms of our society. But I tell you what, friends, if you don't go and do it on the streets, you won't do it at home with your friends. You won't do it anywhere. What we've seen over and over, we've been doing this for 30 or 40 years, and I can assure you, the people who evangelise strangers are the people who see their friends converted. And the people who don't evangelise strangers are the ones who never actually share the gospel with their friends. It's a very easy reason to understand why, too. Because I've never heard myself say these words. I've never practised what to say in the real life situation. So when my friend does say to me, but what do I need to do to be saved? I think, what did I hear in second year lecture doctrine class? There was something, no, it was in Acts, in third year, wasn't it? There was a man in Philippi who asked Paul that. Now, what did Paul, by which time the person's gone? <laughs> you, you don't have that option in life, do you? If you've done it over and over and over with people, when the real life situation happens, you know exactly what to say and how to say it and you've heard yourself do it and you'll be able to. And so talking to strangers, it's a practice session out there with real life ammunition. <laughs> and people do get converted on the streets. <laughs> it's real, it's true. Right? Not huge numbers, but it happens. But what happens even more is the people who go and do it see their friends converted because they know how to evangelise. And when they stand in the pulpit and preach, I know they've been out in the streets and have done it because I can hear it in the way they preach the gospel. It's as clear as a bell. As they teach the Bible, they're gospel preachers. You can hear the difference. And so after mission, we're going to meet again. I can't remember what it is, but it's after mission. And we'll talk about evangelism and the mission, because uh, some of you, you'll see people doing things you didn't know they could do. You thought that you were sitting in a classroom of dunderheads, and now you see people who've really got gifts. And you'll also discover, I hope, that you're inadequate and don't know exactly what to do and want to know how to do more. And so we'll talk it, and we'll talk more about how, to, how you teach evangelism, because you're going to mission to see it and hopefully to do it. And when you come back, you need to learn how to teach it because that's the third part of learning how to do this kind of thing.